Hi everybody, welcome back to Embrace the Journey with Sharon. I'm Sharon and my guest today is Jennifer Hancock. I'm very excited that she's here today to speak about a subject that uh, I feel we need to shine some light on. Uh, the intention behind the show is not to create anger in anybody or to point fingers. Uh, the intention is to empower and inspire us to help our children recognize their uniqueness and the beauty in that, in each of us being different. I was touched a few weeks ago by a video about a young girl by the name of Amanda Todd. Uh, she created a video uh, using flashcards and described her life over the last year. She was bullied um, and she chose to take her life. And that saddened me greatly. Uh, I feel that we lost something beautiful um, in her life not being here anymore. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about what we can do and how we can um, empower our children. So I invited Jennifer here today to do that. Jennifer wrote a book called The Bully Vaccine. And she's actually written a few books now, right? Yeah. But <clears throat> I met her a few months ago and she was sharing this book and I thought it'd be appropriate to have her here. So welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me on and yeah. to discuss this important topic. Yeah, yeah. So how did you come about writing the book? What was it that touched your life? Um, I decided to write the book after Jamie's suicide. Um, you know, Amanda's not the first child to be bullied to death. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's, it's preventable. It's, this is preventable. These suicides are preventable. And there's, you know, I was taught by my mom explicitly how not to be bullied. Mm -hmm. And it worked. And I was never bullied. I had a deformed jaw. I, I was a band geek. I was intellectual. I should have been bullied. I was never bullied. Why? Because my mom taught me what it is bullies are looking for and how to not give it to them mm -hmm. so that they leave you alone. And it works. And I have taught this to my son. And, you know, he's handled bullying situations quite well as well. And he's stood up, more important, he stood up for other kids who are being bullied. And it, it seems to me if you know how to get bullying to stop, at this point in our society, it is immoral not to share that information. Because kids are committing suicide over this. They probably always have. But now we know more about the reasons why kids are committing suicide. To know that bullying is playing a factor in it. So. Yeah, I, I, there was a sense of shame for me when I watched the video. And I, I don't have children, um, but I, they are so much a part of our world. I mean, so for anybody, uh, you don't have to be a parent to be right. the one to help empower and inspire them. Um, and I've also recognized in speaking to a few people since this video that, you know, you used to think it was the, the band geek or the smart kid that got bullied, but it's really not now. I was speaking to a few young girls and I, th these were pretty girls. Usually they were the ones that were doing the bullying, but evidently there's almost a shift in that now. No, it's always, it's, it's kind of always been this, the same. There's um, evolutionary psychologists who are looking into the mean girl, bad boy phenomenon. Yeah. And the bullies are actually not the dominant kid. It's the people just below the dominant kid and they're not sure of their status. It's an insecurity, mm. right? They're not sure where they stand in their social grouping. So they pick on kids below them in the social grouping to elevate themselves up is what that pretty girl phenomenon is. And so there's a lot of sniping because they're all trying to curry the favor of the dominant individual. Mm -hmm. If they're dominant, they don't need to do this, and it's rarely the dominant person who's doing it. It's the people just below them in the, the social structure that's doing it. Yeah, and I also read a statistic, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they, the statistic actually said that two, two out of three of the teens now, within a year's period of time, are either physically or verbally bullied. Oh yeah, it happens. I don't think you get through school without it happening to you. And what we do know is that for the majority of kids, regardless of the reasons why it's happening to them, it's traumatic. It's, mm -hmm. it's emotionally traumatic and it rewires the brain and it's, it's the stuff, this is what adults remember from their childhood, mm -hmm. is not necessarily all the good times, but this horrific period where they were the victim. Mm -hmm. And almost every adult, except for people like me, have these stories. So, you know, it's, it, it really is a problem and it's an impacting not just the children, but the children who become adults mm -hmm. and it impacts how we respond in the workplace to workplace bullies mm -hmm. 
because we've been kind of conditioned that there's no point in responding or reporting or you just keep your head down and you don't stand up. Yeah, for what is sad. right, yeah. because you got to keep your hand down and not draw the attention of these bullies to yourself, because that's what you've been conditioned as to what works mm -hmm. to keep yourself out of the side. So it's actually really rare to find someone who's got the courage to stand up and be morally courageous when someone is abusive as an adult. And this translates into politics. <laughs> it translates. It that's, translates into everything. Yeah, I mean, you talk about bullying. I mean, I had one incident when I was younger that I can remember. Somebody asked me, and I could remember it. I that's remember, right. you know, when it happened and, and what happened. But I'll tell you the greatest impact for me uh, was when I was in high school not knowing where I stood and feeling myself out and not necessarily taking the, I didn't take the high road. I, I got, I went down a road that was a little bit darker than most. And it was actually the teachers that disempowered me, that told me, you know, you're not going to amount to anything. You're this, that, or the other thing. So that did affect <sighs> okay, me for a long period. Try not to get mad. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, <laughs> that did mad. affect me. And so what I hear you saying is, Bullying is not just bullying. Bullying is because we've, those people have been affected by something in their life, correct? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why bullying occurs, but mostly it occurs because it works. It, mm -hmm. it helps create a power differential that the bully exploits. Bullying is not simply a conflict between two people. It's actually the exploitation of a weakness. Yeah. And it can occur between any two people when one person's willing to exploit that weakness for their gain. Yeah. And it can be either verbal domination or physical domination or threat of physical domination yeah. that affects this. But it's really this power differential. And the key to getting it to stop is to not allow that power differential to take place. And it's very hard if you're physically, in school, if you're physically small or you're, I mean, kids don't have the social skills that they need because they're in the process of learning them. Mm -hmm. That's what childhood is. It's the process of learning the social skills yeah. you need. And we believe, we absorb that. Uh, you know, going back to my situation, when I look at it, that did affect me for uh, quite a few years. Oh, yeah, and then I learned to educate myself and empower myself and discovered that I am more. I am different. I am unique. And all I was doing was exploring myself at that time. And if they had said, we understand that you're exploring and we want to help you to maybe look at, at, at some different perspectives on right. it instead of the way that they did handle it, it may not have impacted me so that I would go down the road as yeah, far as if, I went. If you had had a support network, but even when you do, you know, when I was in high school, I had one, te one teacher who was mean to me. And, you know, I was one of the smart kids, always got A's. And this guy was giving me C's and D's on my English test. All the kids that I had grown up with, well, you all know who's getting A's and who's getting B's. Mm -hmm. They were getting better grades than me. And they're like, how is this even possible? My mom actually wrote an essay for one of my high school classes. And she got a C on it. And she was shocked. <laughs> and, it was, and, it, and the thing was, I was being singled out. Because yep. I had the audacity to raise my hand when my teacher in English said, I don't even like poetry. I, don't, I hate teaching it. And I raised my hand, stupid kid that I was, and said, how are we supposed to get anything out of poetry if you don't like it? Mm. And from that moment on, I was, he, mm. he would sit behind me during tests and eat corn nuts and say, you're going to fail. Wow. All right. And all my other teachers were great. He was the only teacher I ever had a problem with. Yeah. But all my grades in the other classes suffered, and it took me a year and a half to get my confidence up in my writing again. And that, that's a key word right there, is the confidence. Because right. like you said, it is... When we're at that age, um, and and you know we keep, we, we're referring to the kids today, but this really speaks to all levels and and all yeah. ages because many of us still on a daily basis look at things to build our self esteem and to build our confidence, and we can so easily get knocked down. Yeah, and so I knew easily. I knew the problem wasn't with me. Yeah, and I was still knocked down. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what's so shocking. I knew it wasn't with me. And I had a support network around me telling me it wasn't me. Yeah. And that had my back. And it still knocked me down. Yeah. This is, this sort of, I don't think, you know, it's, it's very clear that the people who are doing this sort of thing are not thinking about the consequences of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. it, they're defending themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they're not paying attention to the long term, or the impact that they're having on other people. And this kind of plays out in the bullying world as well. Um, Salon.com 
sent a bunch of authors out to confront their high school bullies mm -hmm. or their childhood bullies. And to a T, none of the bullies remembered the incidences. They actually liked the person that they had bullied and caused that much trauma to. Wow. And what they all said is, I wasn't aware of what was happening to you. I was dealing with this, 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 and you know, my sister and whatever, and my aunt died, and you know, they remember their own trauma. Mm -hmm. And at the period of time that they were taking it out on someone else, and this is a very common thing to have happen when people so are they're suffering, acting out. they 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 can't handle their own pain, so they put it onto other people. Mm. Right. So this is a cycle that's been going on, and and it carries from the parents down to the children, and keeps going on. So. I guess the biggest uh, thing to look at right now is how can we empower ourselves as the adults? How can we embrace the differences and, and teach our children to do the same thing? Because I, it's that simple and that hard um, because we're, we're taught, you know, when you, when you look at the news and the media, everything defines us as being different and separate but not in a positive way. I don't feel any way. I think a lot of it um, teaches us that, you know, it's good to be different, it's good to be separate, but in a way that's c cutting the connection off to the other human right. being that we're with. So what would be some ways um, that are in your books or through your studies that you could share that you feel would have the most impact um, that people could use? There's several things, and there's several techniques I teach in the books and through the course of my writing, and actually this is rather the theme of all of my work that I do, it, the life skill teaching that I do. The first thing is to educate ourselves on what exactly the skills are that need to be learned. So many adults never learned how to protect themselves from negative people as a child because their parents didn't know. They kind of fumble through and figure it out. And the, the this common wisdom is, this is something you just have to learn. This is a life skill you just have to learn. Well, yes, it's a life skill you need to learn, but it's something you can actually be taught. You don't have to figure it out on their own. Right now, what we're doing is akin to throwing kids into the pool and saying, sink or swim. Mm -hmm. Figure it out on your own. And what we should be doing is teaching them the actual skills because they are teachable. You can teach them to a pre-kindergartner or a kindergartner. What to say, how to say it. It's really that simple. What do you say to someone who's being mean to you? How do you say it? There's more to it than that, but you can get a kid to do that and they'll, they'll reap the benefit immediately from that particular skill. Like, because wouldn't you have liked to know when you were a kid what to say to someone who's being mean to you? and how to say it, and you have to practice it. The next thing that's super, 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 super important is the compassion part. Mm -hmm. And this is the one thing that when I'm teaching this skill, people reject. They don't want to do it. They, they don't want to feel compassion for people who are hurting them. And I think a lot of times they think that by feeling compassion for someone who's being mean or destructive, that they're making what's happening to them okay. And nothing could be further from the truth. When you feel compassion for someone who's mean or being a jerk, it does nothing for the jerk. It's actually a very selfish thing you, you do for yourself. And the reason I, I coach people to take a compassionate approach to mean people is because it helps you understand why the other person is doing what they're doing, that it's not about you. When people are being mean or they're acting inappropriately or they're acting rude, the reason we, we remember these incidences is because they are so out of the ordinary. Most people are just trying to get along, they fumble about, but they're not intentionally mean. When someone is intentionally mean, it comes as a complete shock, which is why it, it's traumatic to us. And when we step back and we look at that person as a human being who is suffering to the point that they're not behaving properly. It changes how we view the entire interaction. It's no longer about us. It's about them and what their pain is and what their suffering is that's causing them to behave inappropriately. And you've mentioned that several times. Right. It's not about us. Right. Mm -hmm. And w when you talked earlier about this individual, the, need, the, the balance between being an individual and still being connected to other people. This is 
the central existential angst that everyone in humanity struggles with. Mm -hmm. How to be an individual and yet how to be connected. And again, compassion is the key to that. It's the absolute key. When you reach out to people in compassion, even the jerks, and especially you need to, it's hardest with the jerks, but it's the most important reason why to do this, is the difference is if you're, if you're in pain and you're thinking about your pain and you're thinking about the negative impact someone's having on you, it's all about you. It's kind of like isolating yourself in a little shell. Mm -hmm. You're cutting yourself off from other people by making it about you. Yes, you're hurt. Yes, you're suffering because of what someone else is doing. But by focusing on your hurt, you're isolating yourself from other people. When you reach out in compassion to the jerks, it's not really going to do anything for the jerk. But instead of focusing on yourself, you're reaching out to other people in humanity. Not to deny who you are, but to reach out with compassion to others who are different. And, and I feel that maybe you you will make a difference in that other person's life. You know, you, you mentioned it might not, but maybe nobody has been reaching right. out to them and that's why they're, you know, putting out the, the way they are. And, you know, it is possible. I mean, there are great leaders that show us this, you know, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, to just to name a few, right. where these people were not spoken to well, not treated well, and they learned to embrace the other person and in doing so, embraced themselves and went on to do, to do amazing things and exactly. have an amazing ripple effect in our world. The people who learn this skill, and, and there is it's a It's a leadership skill. It's a leadership skill. Every major philosopher, every major religion throughout the entire course of history preaches compassion. Mm -hmm. Active compassion. Yeah. Not passive compassion. Active. There is a reason for it because it is so transformative, not just for the individual. But for humanity, these are the people, the people that learn this are the ones that go forward. And they're not just moral people. They're incredibly moral people. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are courageously moral, who are not willing to allow suffering to be caused to anybody. And, you know, and yet they still make mistakes. And they, they still make mistakes. Right. Yeah, you know, oh, I mean, that is part of being human. We, we all make mistakes every day, and we were, we were talking earlier that I like to call them mistakes. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, that as adults, we make a mistake and we, get, we show anger around it. Instead of teaching the lesson to our children that I made a mistake and this is how I grew out of it. Um, and that's another way of, of sharing. And this is, this is, to me, an essential coping skill is you need to not just have compassion for other people, you need to have compassion for yourself because yeah. you're not perfect. And I always remember, like, I'm Mary, right? So, uh, you know, when my husband does something that annoys me and I think, oh man, right? Mm -hmm. I think, well, wait a second. You know, I'm not perfect either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? and not today anyway. Not today anyways, <laughs> and not yesterday. And I'm sure there's stuff I do that annoys him too. Yeah. And as soon as I fall back and stop making it about how he's not perfect, because most of the conflict in the world is about our disappointment that someone else is not perfect. Mm -hmm. And when we sit back and we think, wait a second, I'm not perfect either, and I'm going to extend this person the same compassion I hope people extend to me when I am an idiot, and it happens, you know, that it makes those interpersonal conflicts so much, in fact, it makes those interpersonal conflicts go away. Because as soon as you stop trying to make someone else perfect, because you recognize it's not possible for yourself to be mm -hmm. perfect and it's okay that you're not perfect, those conflicts go away because you're not trying to control the behavior of the other person And anymore. we can't. We and can't, you can't do that. You and can't do it anyways. Yeah. But it requires compassion yeah. for yourself. And embracing the difference. And embrace the difference. But it, it actually requires you to be compassionate with yourself yeah. before you can extend that compassion to the other person. Yeah. Did you hear that? We need to be compassionate with ourselves. I mean, this is something where if you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, that should be the first thing that you say to yourself in the morning. I, I think that's a great affirmation to have is today I will be compassionate with myself. And I think that, that if you start your day that way, it will help you throughout the, the things that come up in our days. Sure. I, I dedicate about two chapters in this book and about two chapters in my other book, The, the Happiness Book. Uh, to being a dork. 
<laughs> to the fact you're a dork. Just accept it and embrace embrace what's wrong with you as you know not that you shouldn't try to do better okay we should all try to do better but you're gonna make mistakes you're gonna put your foot in your mouth you're gonna say the wrong thing in the wrong social situation it happens to all of mm -hmm. us and it, it happens to adults too and if you're expecting perfection from yourself you're gonna be in a constant state of stress and it's much better to kind of think to yourself when these things happen yep dork laugh at yourself laugh at yourself laugh about it not, yourself. not that you accept this of yourself to just be slovenly and horrible but that you you learn from it and say okay i made a mistake i'm going yeah. to try and do better next time and i'm going to learn from this and hopefully next time when i'm in a formal situation i won't say something so stupid yeah i mean this life is right it's about expansion and and Guess what? I've said stupid things too. So gee, we have some type of common ground here. I think, I think we just connected ourselves to every human being on the planet, exactly. right? That's key. That's key, right? Right. Now, th there's another really cool thing in the book here that uh, you actually spent some time, was it in Hawaii? Yeah. And she uh, worked with dolphins. So I wanted One to... One of the few. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was very intrigued by that. And and part of what you learn by through working with the dolphins, you've tied back into... Sure. It's the same skills. This is... A behavioral management is done through operant and classical conditioning. And classical conditioning is pairing a natural response to... to that already happens. So like you get, it's Pavlov's dog, right? You give the dog a steak, it's gonna salivate. Mm -hmm. right? that's, a, that's a classical conditioned response. But you can actually take this knowledge of how animals learn and unlearn behaviors and use that knowledge of how we reward and how we punish and how we ignore behaviors to change how we do things. Uh, for instance, the weight loss thing. That's based on, like if you use Lose It or any of the weight loss systems, it's based on a series of rewards. Mm -hmm. Not punishments, rewards. Yeah. And that helps people lose weight. And the knowledge, this has been well studied, well known. Every good animal trainer in the world uses these techniques. And again, it's positive reinforcement and neutral reinforcement. There is no such, you don't use negative reinforcement or punishment in the system because it's counterproductive. And, and this is one of those things that's counterintuitive, but it turns out that negative reinforcement or punishment is treated as reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to get rid of a behavior like bullying, we tend to go, we need to punish this person, we need mm -hmm. to punish this person. Mm -hmm. And that actually reinforces the bullying. And it's, it's counterintuitive, but that's what happens. And this is why getting bullying to stop has been so problematic. But once you know these techniques, it's a lot easier to implement them and say, okay, what I'm gonna do is use the positive and the non-reinforcement mm -hmm. to affect the behavioral change. And that's what works. Yeah. And that's what I teach in there. And it's, I learned these techniques while training dolphins, but you can talk to any psychologist and they will say, yes, this works. Yeah. <laughs> So she's, she's had a very interesting life and is sharing it in her book. So I, I want to thank you for being here today, and, and I hope to invite you back because I think there's a lot more to talk about. And again, the show today is about empowering and inspiring you to embrace the differences in each other and the uniqueness in each other. And what she what Jen ended up on is the negative and the positive and here at the amazing universe broadcasting company you know this about us that we believe what we put out into the world is what we attract so if you are putting negative out there that is what will come your way and that will keep the cycle going on and on and on so what 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 I'm asking of you today is actually to be the positive to embrace your children to teach them to be compassionate to themselves first and then to the others that are around them. And I'm asking you to be compassionate with yourself and be compassionate with the others around you. I thank you and we will see you for the next show. Bye.